Thank you, everyone. Uh, welcome to our colloquium today. Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome Mike Zalatel from uh, UC Berkeley. Mike is an uh, assistant professor there, but also the Thomas and Allison Schneider Chair. <laughs> and uh, Mike graduated uh, with a bachelor's degree from Harvard in 2009, and he did a PhD with uh, Joe Moore at Berkeley. Uh, in 2015, and, and that's why me and Mike are uh, overlapping at Berkeley. I was a postdoc, and Mike was a, a student, and at that time, it's already obvious uh, that Mike is commanding his own troop, uh, doing his uh, project. They were, they did this uh, beautiful work uh, using a matrix product state to represent fractional column ball and, and doing both numerical and analytical analysis of a, a fractional column ball system. And, uh, and after that, um, among other other works, and then after that, I did a postdoc at a, a station Q, and he was a faculty at a Princeton for a very short time, and then moved on to Berkeley, and has been there since 2018. And over the years, uh, so so Mike's research you will see from his talk was he's strong, very strong, both on the analytical side and also on the numerical side, and he can combine those things and then figure out what's actually uh, happening in some experimental system. So he has worked on, for example, Dirac cones in Kagomin Atom Spin Liquid, uh, fractional turn insulator in Van der Waals petal structure, uh, twisted by layer graphene uh, uh, with anomalous ball fur magnetism, and some special insulating sticks. And for all his contribution, uh, he was awarded uh, the, the William Macmillan Award uh, for Outstanding Contribution in Transmatter Physics in 2018. So today he's going to tell us about uh, charged spermions and supercooling bacteria. Great, thank you very much, Xi. It's great to be back here. This is my first talk since after the pandemic, so it feels really good to do it in person. I'm excited to be here. So uh, today I'm gonna to be talking about uh, charged skirmions and superconductivity. The work was actually inspired by, uh, in part by amazing experiments being done here by uh, Stefan's group, for instance, working on twist and bilayer graphene. Uh, but I'll try and situate the motivation for it uh, in a larger context uh, and talk about what experiments might be going on in the future to figure out whether this sort of physics is really happening. So just an overview of the talk. First, I just want to introduce what skirmions are. Uh, I'm going to be talking about them in the context of condensed matter physics, but they first um, were proposed really in, in uh, the field of nuclear theory. Uh, then I'm going to introduce this idea of how skirmions might give a new route uh, towards pairing electrons into Cooper pairs and how that could lead to superconductivity and why potentially it might be happening in twisted bilayer graphene. Uh, and finally, I'm gonna talk about a collaboration with an experimental group at uh, Princeton, the Ozdani's group, um, who are able to use STM to actually image the presence of uh, quantum skirmions trapped in two-dimensional systems. And this might be the way forward to figuring out whether the superconductivity idea is really happening. So first, some background on skirmions. Um, they were invented by Tony Skirmy in the, the 60s, uh, and he himself was actually inspired by uh, a much older set of ideas that you can think is going back to Lord Kelvin. And that this is this very beautiful idea that I think a lot of us find aesthetically attractive that are working on topological phases, which is that perhaps particles, rather than being fundamental objects, are really some sort of topological defect in some underlying continuous medium. So for instance, an example of that could be uh, smoke rings, which are vortexes in a field, but uh, in the air, for instance. Uh, but you can imagine that there could be other fields, whether it's the spin texture or maybe the air itself. Um, and because these uh, defects have a certain topological character, uh, they would be stable in the way that particles are. So Kelvin, uh, who's inspired by some of his work showing uh, why structures like this had to be topologically stable, uh, had hypothesized that perhaps different elements, for instance, might be different types uh, uh, of vortices corresponding to various knots. So I mean, this idea we think doesn't literally work out, of course, um, but it still led to a lot of inspiring ideas throughout the field of topological physics. So for instance, condensed matter is of course stolen from Alexi's paper. Uh, you could have uh, systems which, for instance, you could have defects in a liquid crystal in the fractional quantum Hall states. Uh, it turns out that the fractionalized excitations there, you can also think of as sorts of um, uh, vortices or in spin materials, you can have vortices in uh, an order that end up having interesting spin properties and so on. Um, so in condensed matter, there's uh, lots of applications of this now. 
Uh, the particular type of defect I'm going to be talking about, though, is actually proposed by uh, Skirmy in the 60s in this beautiful set of work. So what's the idea? Uh, well, first, we need to identify the field that he was talking about. What's the equivalent of the ether? And in his case, it was actually the fields uh, corresponding to the uh, creation of pions, mesons. So because there's different uh, flavors of the mesons, there ended up being four different fields, pi 1 through sigma here. Uh, which I can organize into a particular vector. So that's the field. Uh, and that vector was actually constrained to have unit magnitude. So you can think of your field as taking values on the three sphere. So if you look at a snapshot in time, then uh, configuration of the field is described by some map from space into configurations on the three sphere. Okay, so since he was interested in thinking about uh, particle light configurations of the field, uh, let's restrict our attention to configurations that have finite energy, and that's going to require that far away from the origin, the field takes on a constant value. And that lets us play this mathematical trick, where rather than thinking of space as being a uh, three-plane, you can do this uh, trick of identifying all the points of the infinity and identify uh, the plane actually with a sphere. And so the field configurations you can think of as a map from a sphere to a sphere. So uh, as soon as you see this, that the field is a map from a sphere to a sphere, you might ask, well, what are the different topologically distinct uh, configurations you can have of maps like that? And those are classified by the homotopy groups. So in this case, this is uh, pi 3 of S3, which is known to have an integer. And that's very promising because we're talking about particles. The first thing you want to be able to identify is how many of them are there. Uh, so this is suggestive that maybe there could be some relationship between this homotopy group and the existence of particles. Um, so to make the picture clear, uh, I didn't really have a budget to do pictures in four dimensions, so it's much easier to step down a dimension and instead consider the same setup where I have a field uh, which is only defined in a two-dimensional space that takes values on the two-sphere rather than the three-sphere. Okay, that's convenient because I can now picture things. A typical field configuration might look like a configuration here, and you can think of that as arising physically, for instance, from perhaps the magnetization in a thin film. So now we can draw some very nice pictures uh, for what these topologically distinct field configurations are. Uh, and what they correspond to is so-called skirmion, where if I think of, you know, it's, it's easier to draw in the map here, at each point in space, I identify as a point in the sphere, and then I make the sphere hairy to indicate the value that the field takes there. And this skirmion configuration is this hedgehog-like thing, or, or like a monopole, where every point in the target space uh, is achieved once at some point in space. And if you flatten it back down to real space here, it basically corresponds to magnetic texture. We're far away, everything's at the South Pole, and then at the origin, it counts down uh, into the North Pole, and then it goes around the equator uh, in the intermediate region. Okay, so that's a skirmion, but because this uh, classification here is an integer, there's also an anti-skirmion. There's different ways to get it. Uh, one is that when you're at the equator, you wind clockwise versus counterclockwise, and that will change the handedness of it. Now, one cool way that you can measure whether these skirmions there or not, of course, it's a global property because it's topological. Uh, but nevertheless, there's a nice uh, formula for how you can get it by piecing together local data. And that's if you uh, calculate this particular uh, combination of gradients, that gives you what we call the skirmion density. And if you integrate that density over space, that gives you the skirmion number. Okay, so uh, from the fact that this is a topological invariant, even if you deform the fields uh, continuously, you can show this Q uh, is conserved. Uh, and that's one of the inspirations for why this thing might actually uh, be ultimately something you could think of as a particle. Okay, but if Tony Skirmi's uh, goal was actually to show that uh, these skirmions uh, wouldn't just be like classical objects, but really might actually be the origin of nucleons. So he wanted the, the fields that would, or the particles that arise to be nucleons. Uh, but at this point, we need to go beyond the concepts Kelvin had, which is we're going to explain that something's a nucleon. We don't need to just say it's a particle. We need to explain, for instance, why is it a fermion rather than a boson? Okay, so that's something you couldn't obviously, you know, see just by saying that the picture of it's a skirmion. So this is a very interesting question. You're starting out with a bosonic field. Uh, how could it be that a uh, texture in a bosonic field could end up giving you a particle which is a fermion? Um, so there's a very interesting series of work through the 60s and 70s beginning to work out uh, how this could be. It was first understood if I step down even more, uh, one more dimension and think about a skirmion in 1D, which is really uh, just a, a map from the real line into a circle. Uh, 
And in that case, the topological textures are just domain walls uh, and a work by Coleman and other, uh, they worked out um, how at the level of the quantum field theory of these sorts of defects, uh, how it is they can in fact have uh, Fermi statistics. As far as I understand, the, uh, the generalization to higher dimensions was only worked out by uh, Witten and others uh, in the 80s. And what they figured out is that th there's certain very phase terms uh, in the dynamics of the bosonic field, uh, which allowed these skirmions to actually um, behave like fermions. Uh, so that kind of completed the circle um, uh, and implied that uh, Skirmi's idea really, really does work. You can think of uh, the nucleons as skirmions in the bosonic pion field. So a very beautiful idea. So we don't want to let uh, high energy theory have all the fun. We'd also like to find skirmions in condensed matter systems. And there's many situations where they arise now. Uh, one of the most obvious ones uh, is indeed to just think about the, the underlying field as being the magnetic order in a thin 2D film. Uh, and just in the last decade or so, people have discovered lots of interesting materials which then exhibit skirmions. So the way it works is you have a ferromagnet, uh, but there's an additional type of interaction due to spin orbit coupling called this DM interaction, uh, which tends to prefer uh, a certain spiraling pattern to occur in the magnetization. And then when you just image uh, the spin density of the ground state, you get patterns like this. So the color is indicating um, sort of the azimuthal angle of the way the spin is pointing. And then regions which are either dark or white correspond to uh, pointing to the north and south pole. So if you look at a region like this here, you'll see it's uh, a skirmion, which is kind of a flattened out in space. So that's one skirmion, and this is another skirmion, and this is another skirmion. So it turns out that spontaneously the ground state of these magnets ends up having a crystal uh, of skirmions pinned into it. Uh, and that gives it very interesting magnetic properties. Uh, in other situations, they occur not in these regular uh, arrays like this, but just they're pinned by defects in some way. And it's cool, you can image it, you just see skirmions in the magnetic texture pinned at those various places. So that's very cool, but it's a, a little bit different than kind of Skirmi's motivation where he wanted to think of the skirmions not just as you know, heavy classical objects, but really as you know, dispersing particles, which might be fermions rather than bosons. And in particular, that they would explain the nucleons themselves. So what might be the analogous ambition we might have in condensed matter theory? Well, it would be really cool actually, if there could be some system which had skirmions in which the electron itself could be understood as a skirmion. I, I kind of take that to be the analog of uh, Skirmi's initial uh, ambitions. And it turns out um, it was already discovered in the 90s. There's a very interesting uh, system where this is in fact the case. Uh, and it occurs in quantum hall ferromagnets to study people like Jim Eisenstein here at Caltech. So what's the setting? Uh, we're going to consider electrons confined into a uh, two-dimensional film like gallium arsenide, very clean and apply a strong magnetic field. Uh, and we get this famous result that at low temperature, uh, there's a series of different phases which arise, which are these quantum Hall states. And one of their distinguishing features uh, is that they carry a Hall conductance, which is always uh, an integer multiple uh, of the fundamental quantum of conductance. So the Hall trace is shown here. It, uh, as a function of magnetic field. And we see that the Hall conductance takes values of two, three, four, five, six, et cetera. So where's the ferromagnetism here? Uh, it comes from the fact that not, not all integers are equal. You'll see in these experiments here that at the highest magnetic fields and at low temperatures, the integers that show up are both even uh, and odd. You'll see two, for instance, as well as five. Whereas when you go to weaker magnetic fields, or also if you just go to lower temperature, you tend to only see the even, uh, the even integer quantum Hall effects show up. So where does this come from? Well, let's think about the physics at the level of the single particle uh, energies available to the system. So when you put electrons in a magnetic field, uh, the kinetic energy gets quenched into a series of flat lambda levels. So there's n equals zero lambda level, one lambda level, two lambda level. Uh, the way we explain these uh, Hall effects is that when the Fermi level lies in between um, the Landau levels, you fill the Landau levels below it, and the number of them you fill just determines uh, the coefficient of the Hall effect. So <clears throat> the difference between odd and even here is going to come from spin. So electrons do carry spin, and it turns out for a material like gallium arsenide, 
uh, the spin splitting from the Zeeman effect is actually really, really small. It would only be uh, at most a, a couple Kelvin compared to the spacing between the land levels. So what you'd expect is that if you fill an even number, your Fermi level is in these big gaps, you're going to get a strong quantum Hall effect, whereas if it's uh, an odd, you're, you're only resolving this tiny spin split. Okay? So you might think that that's the explanation of this uh, effect here. When you're at low magnetic fields, the Zeeman effect is small, and maybe you just don't resolve the splitting there. Uh, but it turns out that that's not the explanation. What's found is if you measure the gap here uh, at high magnetic fields, in the single particle picture, we would have predicted that the gap is just the Zeeman splitting. But in fact, it's found to be almost 100 times larger than that. And if you ask what's the energy scale which sets uh, the gap uh, at odd filling, it's actually the Coulomb scale, which is E squared over the typical distance between the particles, which is much larger. So that suggests that the origin of these odd integer quantum Hall effects is not a single particle effect, but really an interacting one. Um, and work by Shivaji Sondi and others in the 90s uh, discovered that really it's a form of spontaneous symmetry breaking. So due to the Coulomb uh, interaction, there's an effect very similar to the Hoon's effect just in atoms, which prefers if you occupy an odd number of lambda levels that you fully spin polarize the system and that leads the Coulomb interaction to open up a gap between the two different spin species, even if you didn't have a Zeeman field at all. So the Zeeman energy ends up weakly picking which one, uh, but if you turn the Zeeman energy off, you would still have spontaneous symmetry breaking, and that's why we call it a quantum Hall ferromagnet. So where do the skirmions come in? Why are they interesting in this quantum Hall setting? Well, just like any magnet, you can, add, you can put skirmions into the, into, the, into the system. Because the Zeeman energy is quite small, there's not actually that much energy penalty coming from the reverse spins in this region. But the really interesting thing is what happens when these skirmions enter into bands which have a Hall conductance. So you'll recognize here that this uh, N here is the order parameter. And this was the formula that told us the density of skirmions in any region. And the result is that in the quantum Hall systems, there's actually an electrical charge rho, like the, you know, the real physical electrical charge in direct proportion to the density of skirmions. And the constant of proportionality is exactly the coefficient of the Hall effect, uh, which is plus or minus one for the integer quantum Hall effect, depending on whether the magnetic field is in or out of the plane. Okay, so this tells us that skirmions in quantum Hall states actually carry electrical charge. And if you integrate this relation over one skirmion, it tells you every skirmion you introduce carries charge one. Uh, so what that means is you can actually think of the electrons, if you add charge into it, you insert an electron, it converts into a skirmion. Uh, and that's very much like Skirmi's original idea that the fundamental particles you can actually think of as skirmions. Where does this come from, this relation? There's a kind of interesting argument for it. Uh, the idea is let's put one additional test electron into the system and have it move through some path in this fixed background of skirmions. Well, because of the ferromagnetic interaction as the, uh, as the electron moves, its spin wants to follow the texture uh, in the background. And that interest leads to an interesting very phase effect. So let's say this here is the sphere describing the spin of the test electron. As it moves through here, the spin traces out some path uh, on the block sphere. And in quantum mechanics, uh, that leads to a berry phase in proportion to the area there. Okay, so as spins move through this, they pick up an additional berry phase from the skirmion. And here the Hall conductance comes in. In the quantum Hall state, the Hall response tells you that when you apply an external magnetic field, that induces some extra charge. That's the Hall response. But now you can think of the effective field being applied as coming from two contributions. One is the actual physical magnetic field, but then the other is this kind of uh, pseudo magnetic field coming from the berry phase of the spin as it moves through the canting skirmions. And when you add those two effects together, uh, one finds exactly this relationship here because the, delta, the uh, density of effective magnetic field from the skirmions is that formula there. So that's the origin of this. Uh, and so we now have this picture that if you start with an odd integer quantum Hall state and add electrons, they'll go in in the form of these skirmions here. This is, uh, this is real, this has been seen in experiments. There's a uh, super cool experiment by Barrett. And the way they saw it is they do uh, NMR to measure the degree of spin polarization in the system. So the y-axis here is spin polarization. And then they vary the electron density in the system. So they start out at nu equals one where you're in this uh, quantum Hall ferromagnet. And then they add electrons to the system and they see the spin polarization rapidly decrease. Uh, 
And you can just ask how many magnetic moments did each electron carry that you removed? So naively you'd expect it would be a G factor of two, but what they end up finding is a slope here, which is a factor of almost 10 times larger than that. And that's because when you inject the electrons, they actually go into these big skirmions and those have a large core where the magnetic uh, orientation is uh, flipped. And so that in increases their effective G factor. Okay, so with that background, uh, I wanna now move on to, you know, that was discovered in the 90s. Now that we know that charged skirmions can exist, are there other interesting electrical transport phenomena uh, that we might use them for? And in particular, I'm gonna investigate whether they might give a, a route towards all electronic superconductivity. So the question here is if you have a traditional conventional superconductivity, there's some basic limits on what TC might be. Uh, but if our charge carriers are skirmions, uh, might we be able to evade those limits? And so this part of the talk is a collaboration uh, with a series of postdocs here, uh, including Ashwin Vishwanath's group at Harvard. So if we're gonna talk about superconductivity, uh, we should uh, first just review what are the basic ingredients we need to get a superconductor. And there's really two steps involved. So superconductivity in a very cartoon level, the first thing you need is that the electrons in the system get glued together somehow into these molecules called Cooper pairs. Um, so that's what we call the pairing glue. So naturally, of course, usually electrons want to repel each other. So there needs to be some attractive mechanism that, that, that binds them together. Conventionally, that's phonons. And in our case, it's gonna be something else. Now, the second thing you need is once you have these Cooper pairs, they're bosons. Um, and we'd like to explain superconductivity as basically a Bose-Einstein condensate of these Cooper pairs. Um, but the phenomena that drives uh, Bose condensation is ultimately the kinetic energy of the bosons, uh, which drives them all to sit in the P equals zero state and leads to coherence. Okay, so we need two things, pairing, uh, and then we also need some dispersion of these Cooper pairs. So we might ask, suppose the things we're gonna pair together are skirmions, would they have any favorable properties as far as either pairing gluing uh, or leading to coherence? If we just try and do this in the quantum hall system where they were first discovered, we run into an obstacle. So, uh, you know, to, to get the condensation, you need that the particles have something like a quadratic potential, so they Bose condense there. But when I turn on the magnetic field, we said that the kinetic energy gets quenched and you just have perfectly flat Landau levels where your energy doesn't depend on momentum at all. So this is not gonna be a good situation in which to try and get superconductivity. Now you might think that maybe a skirmion, a single skirmion is more complicated, it's not. Because it carries charge and it's in a magnetic field, it too is just confined into cyclotron orbits and can't really move. Okay, so this magnetic field is bad. So what we wanna find is whether there's some other situation where we might still get charged skirmions without having a net magnetic field. So at this point, we're just gonna go into theory speculation space and just invent a toy model uh, where this is gonna work out. And then a little bit later in the talk, I'll come back to how this is potentially already in a dilution refrigerator at Caltech. Okay, so what's the model? What I'm gonna do is take a quantum hall bilayer. So I'm gonna take you know, one copy of gallium arsenide here and another layer here uh, where the electrons only move in 2D and they can't really tunnel between each other. But then I'm gonna do something a little bit harder to realize. You know, Jim Eisenstein has come up with many famous results in these quantum hall bilayers. But now I'm gonna make the magnetic field have the opposite orientation in the top layer uh, and the bottom layer. That obviously would be much uh, trickier experimentally. So what does the single particle spectrum look like? Well, I just get two copies of the integer quantum Hall effect coming from two layers and everything I've discussed uh, previously would apply. If you put the filling at uh, one plus one, so a density of one in the top and one in the bottom, you'd expect an odd integer quantum Hall effect in both uh, where independently they form ferromagnets. Now there's one other ingredient I need. Now that I know I have two ferromagnets, which is I want to add a term to the Hamiltonian, which is an anti-ferromagnetic coupling between the top and the bottom layer. So the picture I'll draw for this is you can have an N plus, which is the order parameter in the top and N minus in the bottom. You want their spheres to anti-align. Um, physically, that will tend to happen if there's just a little bit of a tunneling between them, okay? But we'll just assume it's there. Okay, so the claim is that a model with this anti-ferromagnetic coupling and long range Coulomb repulsion is a superconductor. So that's all you need to get superconductivity as soon as you dope away from filling two. So why does this occur? Uh, the argument is that it's driven by the interesting physics of skirmions. Okay, so what are the skirmions which are relevant here? Well, the first thing I might try and do 
is just put a skirmion in the top layer and nothing in the bottom layer. Okay. And just by the same argument as before, that's going to carry charge one. But here we run into a problem. There was a term in the Hamiltonian which wanted to anti align the top and bottom layer. But when I put in a skirmion, you need to reduce the spin, you know, you reverse the spins in the core of it. So that's going to lead to an energy penalty in the region here where this anti paramagnetic coupling is not happy. And that's going to drive up the energy of a single skirmion, and it's not as favorable. So, how do I get around that? Well, suppose what I do is I put a skirmion in the top layer and an anti skirmion in the bottom layer. So, the one way to get anti skirmion is you just flip, you just apply the, uh, the inversion map so that the fields are exactly equal and opposite. Well, now because you've done that, the anti ferromagnetic coupling is perfectly happy everywhere. Uh, and let's look at what the charge of this object is. Well, in the top layer, I made a skirmion and the churn number was one because the magnetic field is out of the plane. So that's going to carry charge one. And in the bottom layer, I made an anti skirmion, but the magnetic field had the opposite orientation. So the role between skirmion number and electrical charge gets reversed. So two wrongs make a right. And you also find that the bottom layer carries charge one. So this uh, bound, well, if it formed a bound state, this object would have charge two rather than charge one. And so it would be a boson, which potentially could bose a condense. Okay. So this is going to be the idea that, in fact, uh, skirmions in the system always get bound in this way. And then this uh, bound state of skirmions might condense. But there is a question we need to answer, which is, why would it be energetically favorable for this to happen? The dominant scale in these systems is just Coulomb repulsion. It's not screen. There's not a metal because we're starting with an insulator. And these skirmions are just going to repel each other as one over R. Um, so why would they actually want to sit on top of each other? Uh, so there's an interesting competition here between the Coulomb repulsion and this anti-ferromagnetic interaction we talked about earlier. So this is kind of simple scaling region for why this should work. Uh, when you introduce a skirmion, it can spread out over some potentially very large radius R. And if you make both of the skirmions of radius R and put them on top of each other, that blurs out the Coulomb uh, interaction over a scale R. So the maximum potential that they'll experience when right on top of each other uh, scales as one over the skirmion radius. Okay, so making big skirmions just reduces the Coulomb repulsion. On the other hand, uh, when we look at the anti ferromagnetic interaction, if they're far apart, um, uh, you pay a penalty J wherever the skirmions are in proportion to their size. Okay, so this is what leads to a retraction. And you can see from this that as long as I make the skirmion sufficiently large, this attraction is always going to win out over the repulsion. And so we can conclude that by this mechanism, you can get binding for infinitesimal or arbitrarily small j. Uh, and Shubayu actually checked that this mechanism really works by um, solving a nonlinear sigma model, taking into account Coulomb repulsion and so on. Uh, and you indeed find that infinitesimal j leads to pairing. So this is one of the few ways that I know of the getting around Coulomb repulsion without uh, appealing to effects like retardation and so on, which are usually used in, um, for instance, phonon mediated superconductivity. Okay, and the final ingredient we need to get superconductivity now that we know they pair um, is you need to have some dispersion relation for the fermions. This is also a little mysterious because we started out with lambda levels with the kinetic energies completely quenched. So how could it be that the skirmions themselves would have something like a parabolic dispersion? And it's a cool argument here coming from the topology of the Landau levels. So let's take our skirmion pair and boost it to velocity v. So because each layer is effectively in a magnetic field, as the pair starts moving, the top one's going to uh, experience a Lorentz force in one way, and the bottom one's going to experience a Lorentz force in the other way. So this is going to pull them apart through the Lorentz force. Now, the reason they don't fly away is because the Lorentz force is going to be counteracted by whatever the binding energy is. And so they're going to reach, as a function of the velocity, they're going to reach some equilibrium distance where those two come into, uh, into balance, and then that pair will travel like that. OK, but what that meant is that as you're boosting it, it's pulling apart the pair, and that costs some binding energy. So the net result of this is, I mean, the details of the magnitude depend on the precise form of the binding energy. But if we just take a quadratic expansion, it means that the energy of a skirmion pair at velocity v is going to end up increasing quadratically uh, is v, where the scale of the effective mass is basically set by the strength of the binding here. And it turns out to essentially be the scale of j. Uh, 
So this gives a way that the purely an interaction effect uh, to, to get a finite mass for these skirmions, even though the electrons themselves have no dispersion. Okay, so now we get a, a parabola here for the dispersion set with that mass there, and things are set for superconductivity. Okay, so we have two scales now, the pairing, which is J, and an effective mass here. And if you put this together, you can just ask what then would the effective, uh, what would the temperature be for Bose condensation? Uh, and at least at the mean field level, it takes in uh, form here. It ends up being J times um, the density uh, of skirmions in the system, which depends on how much you dope it. Uh, this is quite a bit different than what you get from BCS superconductivity, where the condensation temperature is actually always uh, of the same scale as the pair binding energy. Um, and as I'll discuss, uh, discrepancy like this, that the condensation temperature can be quite a bit lower than the pairing is actually seen in certain experiments. Okay, but how do we realize this model? Uh, one way to do it would be if you had a sheet made of magnetic monocles, um, that's rather difficult. Uh, but fortunately, we can use the results of Duncan and Haldane and others who realized some time ago that we can effectively realize the physics of Landa levels without any magnetic field at all. If instead we consider lattice models, which have certain complex hoppings uh, in the way the electrons move between the sites. So the most famous of this was uh, Duncan's uh, honeycomb model, but since then many other uh, such uh, structures have been found. So somehow we need to find a material whose band structure uh, is morally the same uh, as these time reverse copies of the quantum Hall effect. And the magic thing actually, and I, you know, my actual interest in this project started with this and ended up discovering the skirmions, not the other way around, uh, is it turns out this very interesting system that's been worked on here at Caltech and elsewhere, uh, magic angle graphene precisely realizes the band structure I've just discussed. So the setting here is you take two levels of graphene and then you stick them on top of each other with a small uh, rotational twist. And that leads to this uh, moiré pattern where different regions, the graphene is stacked on top of each other in different ways. And as, as electrons move through this, they experience that moiré potential as an effective, something like a periodic potential, which reconstructs their band structure. And so going back to the work of Fitzritzer uh, and McDonald and others, uh, people just computed what is the effective band structure in the presence of this moiré potential. And then what they found is that a certain magic angle of about one degree mismatch, the electron bands, this is the dispersion relation, energy versus momentum, end up becoming extremely flat. They have a bandwidth of only a couple MeV, which is very small by condensed matter uh, standards, separated by some band gap. So these things naively look a little bit like a lambda level, at least in the sense that they're, they're a, a flat band. So since then, people have been uh, studying the physics of the system quite a bit. And the really interesting thing that was worked out in this series of papers here is that if you look at these two bands and compute the band topology of them, like their churn number, you find that these two bands have exactly the same topology as two time reverse copies of the quantum Hall effect. So this system here is gonna be uh, the bilayer that we need. So where does superconductivity come in? Uh, well, this field really got uh, started, or at least a lot of the excitement uh, back in 2018, when people took this magic angle graphene and asked what are the electrical properties as a function of the electron density. So the plot here, this is uh, data from uh, the MIT group. Uh, this is the electron density, uh, and this is the uh, electrical conductance. And it was, or yeah, it was found that at certain densities here, uh, the system becomes an insulator even though you wouldn't expect such an insulator from band theory. So this plot here is showing the color is basically um, the degree of resistance in the plane of density and temperature. And it's a zoom in of this here. You end up finding that at this particular density, it's an insulator. And then when that insulator is doped, uh, they found superconductivity. So what's the explanation in terms of this lambda level picture? Well, this particular density ends up uh, corresponding to basically filling two of the lowest effective Landau levels. Uh, so you could think of it as that the origin of this insulator is exactly like the ferromagnetism we discussed with the integer quantum Hall effect, where spontaneously you develop some splitting here uh, and fill only two uh, of the bands there. So that would be a ferromagnetic, some sort of symmetry breaking insulator. And as we discussed, it has the same topology that we discussed before. So when you dope it, uh, potentially the electrons could go in as skirmions and realize the skirmion superconductivity. 
Um, so what is the critical temperature you might be? Well, we can just take that formula we estimated earlier uh, and we can do some microscopic calculations I won't get into to try and estimate what the magnitude of this J term is. And it turns out that the scale you get for um, superconductivity is about 10 Kelvin uh, times the doping, which is you know, reasonable. I'm not claiming it's quantitative at all, but it's basically the scale that's seen in experiment to something a bit below a Kelvin. Okay, so potentially we have this extremely exotic um, idea for superconductivity. Like Jason, when I first heard about this, I'm not sure I could believe it was true. It sounds kind of crazy. Um, what is the experimental evidence for or against it? Uh, well, the situation at the moment is rather complicated, but one thing we do know, and this is really beautiful recent experience, uh, experiments from Stefan's group, is that when it's accumulating evidence that the superconductivity in the magic angle graphene uh, is definitely something strongly score correlated and doesn't seem to be like a conventional BCS theory. Uh, in particular, there actually seems to be evidence here that in a, a wide region of the phase diagram, the superconductivity is consistent with Bose-Einstein condensation. There seems to be some very strongly uh, paired particles in the system, which perhaps are the skirmion pairs, uh, which then Bose condense. Okay, but this here, these sort of experiments so far don't give any direct evidence for skirmions. Um, we'd like to figure out is what experiment could you do to, to, to really see that this might be happening. Um, so the idea I'm going to talk about in the final couple slides of the talk is that perhaps actually we could use scanning tunneling microscopy to image the graphene, the magic angle graphene, and really see that electrons go in in the form of skirmions in this system. Um, and one context that I need to give to explain how this might happen, and I've kind of neglected it over it before, is we need to think a little bit more carefully in the magic angle realization of these skirmions, what exactly is the order parameter I'm talking about that, that forms skirmions. So in the quantum Hall effect, it was the electron spin. It turns out that in the magic angle graphene, uh, the relevant two degrees of freedom is not the electron spin, but actually it's valleys. So in graphene, when you look at the band dispersion, there's two low energy valleys, uh, distinguish it different momenta. And the spin that's going to be relevant for us is actually whether it's in the K or the K prime valley. Okay, so the skirmions we're talking about are skirmions in the valley space. And then the fundamental question then is, could it be possible that you could use STMs, STM to image uh, the presence of valley skirmions? Okay, so that brings us uh, to the final part of the talk. Um, I want to explain this uh, really amazing work from Ali Yazdani's group uh, showing that the answer is yes. Uh, you can use STM to literally detect the presence of charged valley skirmions. The system they're looking at is a bit simpler than twisted bilayer graphene. They've only gone half the way there. They only look at monolayer graphene. Okay. Um, so the system we're going to look at is monolayer graphene. And this is more like the quantum Hall case. We're going to put it in a strong magnetic field. Uh, and as I'll walk through, the STM images show the presence of skirmions. So how does this work? Um, First, for better or worse, I need to give a little bit of introduction to the quantum Hall ferromagnetism of graphene. It's a little bit more complicated uh, than the older systems like gallium arsenide. And that comes to the fact that uh, in graphene, in addition to the electron spin, it has this valley that we've talked about, K and K prime. So when you look at the Landau level spectrum of graphene, it's quite interesting. The graphene uh, follows the Dirac equation. So you get Landau levels that both go to negative energy and positive energy coming from the, the Roxy. And then each Landau level actually comes in four copies. There's a twofold copy, which I'm denoting by red and blue here coming from the spin. But then there's another twofold copy coming from the two valleys. So each of these Landau levels is actually fourfold degenerate. Uh, and so that's why people uh, describe the sort of physics here is, is going to be SU4 quantum Hall ferromagnetism referring to uh, rotations in what we call the isospin space, which is this combination of spin and valley. So what we, we expect based on three fermions versus what's found in the actual experiments, in the absence of interactions, you'd only expect to see gaps arise every time you fill four isospin degenerate Landau levels, and you then predict that the Hall conductance would go up in steps of four. What's actually seen in clean samples at high magnetic fields is you see all the integers occur. So this is exactly the analog of what we were talking about with the integer quantum Hall effect, that you see odd integers in addition to the even integers. 
And so the picture here is really very similar. There's going to be ferromagnetism in this SU4 space. But it's a little bit more interesting when you have four components um, because there's a, a richer space of possible order parameters you could have. So for the rest of the talk, the case I'm going to uh, focus on is when you're in an electron density, which is trying to fill two uh, of the four degenerate Landau levels. So one way you could do this is you could spin polarize the system. Uh, another way you could do it is you could valley polarize it. But really, there's much, you know, a continuum of ways to do it. And the one that's going to end up being important is what we call intervalley coherence. So each electron in the system ends up going into a coherent superposition of the two valleys with some relative phase E phi. Uh, and it does so both with spin up and then there's another with spin down. So I'll call that an intervalley coherent order. So lucky for us, it turns out that valley order is um, what ends up being the actual relevant symmetry breaking. So I'm going to focus on it from here on out. And there's a nice notation I can develop for it. Um, let's just write down what the order parameter is. So because I have spin and valley, I can write down poly matrices in the spin space, and I can write down poly matrices in the valley space. And my valley order parameter, which I'm going to end up putting the skirmions and stuff into, is exactly just going to be the expectation value of the electrons uh, in the valley pseudospin space. Okay, so I can draw pictures for the different types of orders. If you point in the z direction, uh, your order parameter, that corresponds to valley polarizing, either to the north or the south pole. Whereas if your order parameter goes into the xy plane, that comes from spontaneous coherence between the two valleys. So these are the intervalley coherence ones. And in that case, I also need to describe what the azimuth angle uh, phi is, which describes the phase of this order. So why is valley order, in particular intervalley order, interesting? Well, it's going to actually be very favorable for being able to detect it using STM. And the reason is, remember, physically, um, the, the two valleys are at different momenta in the Brillouin zone. So if electrons go into a state which is a superposition of two different momenta, that corresponds to a state which spontaneously breaks translation invariance because uh, momentum is no longer a good quantum number. So the physical um, prediction, if you have this intervalley coherence, is that there's going to be some density wave, some like charge density wave, a crystal, uh, which triples the unit cell. So what do the resulting patterns look like? Let's just ask, what is the electron charge density in the different uh, types of orders zoomed in to the scale of the actual carbon lattice? Uh, and just by looking at the wave function, you find a series of different patterns. If it's polarized uh, along the valley, it turns out that all the electron weight is on either the A or the B sublattice of graphene. Whereas if it goes into this intervalley coherent state, you can see it makes these patterns where the graphene unit cell is tripled, like this hexagon uh, is different than uh, this hexagon. Okay, And this, this sort of pattern is often called a Kekulé distortion. And the particular shape of the pattern depends on what the intervalley coherent phase is. So we can actually make a, a, a wave of these different types uh, of intervalley coherent states. How do these patterns here depend on the precise angle of the order? And there's this cool continuous evolution Whereas the phase winds, the Kekulé order slowly shifts over uh, by one unit cell. So this is very promising because it tells us if we could somehow measure the charge density in the system and then compare against these sorts of pictures, we could actually figure out exactly where you are in the valley uh, block sphere. So we can detect that order parameter. And that means if there's a skirmion in this order parameter, we might be able to just literally see it uh, in the pattern of the charge density. So here are the actual STM images from Ali's group. Um, first, let's just start in a clean region of the sample. And this left curved here is the only one really need to focus on for now, is just imaging in the ground state, what is the charge density of the system at the scale of the actual carbon atoms. So you can see here, there's the, the honeycomb. And the electron seems to have kind of organized themselves into these more tightly bound uh, bonds here in a way that triples the unit cell. That's exactly consistent uh, with that particular type of phase here. Uh, here's another region of it. They've just looked elsewhere in the sample, and it looks more like these kind of like hexane uh, rings. So that's a region where uh, the order parameter uh, had a different phase. Okay? So this was actually one of the first experiments that confirmed that graphene at charge neutrality in this magnetic field has this sort of symmetry breaking uh, with intervalley coherence. So how are we going to hope to see skirmions? Well, the idea is, because 
this is in a magnetic field, the skirmions like before carry charge. So if we can introduce a charge somewhere in the system and pin it, if this hypothesis is correct, we should see a skirmion appear there. So the way they do that is they take advantage of the fact that their samples, this is the graphene on the top or on top of the substrate, which occasionally very rarely has some impurity in it, which produces some sort of um, uh, pinning potential. And so naturally just from the electrostatics, the system wants to tend to uh, put an electron in the, the two dag above it in order to screen that impurity potential. So you trap a charge there. And now we'd like to see if we could scan around on the sample and find one of these impurities do we see magically when you're in this state uh, that a skirmion emerges there? Uh, so let's look. They scanned all through the sample. Generally, it's completely pristine, but they got lucky. And they found right here, um, there, there's some defect exactly consistent with a charge deep in the sample. You can see the scale of this is way zoomed out compared to the graphene. This is 30 nanometers by 30 nanometers. Um, and there's this beautiful data here showing some sort of pattern uh, at the graphene scale. So now what I want to do to look for skirmions is I'm going to zoom in uh, on these four regions here. And that's the blown up boxes here. Now what you'll find is that in each of these boxes, there is a tripling of the unit cell uh, consistent with some sort of intervalley coherent order. But the precise detail of the patterns you'll see seems to be shifting as you move around. Uh, and you can track and find that that's exactly consistent with the angle of the intervalley coherence somehow like wandering around in the plane uh, as you're moving here, right? So it's exactly like your, your order parameter is tracing some texture. So uh, what Jamming and collaborators did is they took detailed image in every single little box you could take here, analyzed each of these images and using some automatic procedure, we were able to detect by comparing with these sorts of plots here, uh, what your order parameter is. Uh, so that gave him a procedure to go from this data here and actually extract this cool texture that emerges in the plane. And you can see it's a little bit hard at this resolution here. There's indeed some swirling pattern here uh, that emerges only in the presence of the charge defect. So to make sense of it, it's a little bit helpful um, to instead uh, work on color plots. So what I'm going to do is separately measure what is the degree NZ how much is the order parameter pointing out of the plane? That's this color plot here. Uh, and then this color plot here is what is the angle that it takes uh, an intervalley coherent plane. And the data you see is this here. The general feature you see is there's kind of like a dipole in the NZ. And then the, the phase also has something kind of like a dipole uh, oriented in the other direction. So what do we expect uh, from the skirmion theory of quantum Hall ferromagnets? Um, I'll skip over the calculations, but we can just ask what would a skirmion look like, just semi-classical level, if it was trapped uh, to a charge like that. And we can just work out from the field theory what the particular uh, configuration is of the valley order. And the theory gives these two plots here, uh, which look surprisingly close to what the experiment looks like. And what's, you know, the object that is in these plots is exactly that there's a charge one valley skirmion uh, localized here. So it all seems consistent with the fact that when STM, uh, by doing this analysis, we're able to image uh, the presence of charge one skirmions trapped defects. So, I mean, the hope going forward, um, this has nothing to do with superconductivity. This was in a magnetic field, uh, but potentially if similar experiments like this can be applied, for instance, uh, to the magic angle graphene, we might be able to see that as you uh, introduce charge into those systems, uh, skirmions uh, start appearing, and that would be some interesting evidence. Maybe this uh, skirmion superconductivity uh, is really viable. Okay, so with that, I'm going to conclude. Um, we had this inspiring idea that uh, particles might actually be topological textures, and we don't need to just think of them as classical things. They can really be quantum objects, quantum statistics, fermionic statistics. Um, these objects are really happening in experiments. Uh, and I think there's lots of interesting open questions about what, what the consequences of this would be, not just for superconductivity, but perhaps other transport uh, phenomena not yet to be considered. Okay, and with that, I'll thank my collaborators. <clears throat>
Yeah. It doesn't care how big it is. Yeah. So if there's no thing potential and you have a single layer, an isolated fermion, what determines its size? Um, there's two things. So the, the Coulomb repulsion wants it to grow because, you know, when you have this fermion texture, that carries a physical... It's like a, it's like a ball of charge. Yeah, it's like a ball of charge, and that just has one over our Coulomb repulsion, and that tends to make the skirmions want to grow. The what limits the growth is two things. In, there, there could be nonlinear terms of like higher order gradients, but really what happens is that let's consider the quantum Hall case. You had this Zeeman energy; it's very small because it's like 0.2 Kelvin per Tesla. But in principle, that penalizes uh, the area where the spin reverses. So the bigger you make your skirmion, eventually you start experiencing that penalization from the Zeeman energy. And so there's some compromise where the Coulomb wants to grow, the Zeeman wants it to shrink, and that sets the typical size of the skirmions. Uh, so that was worked out by Shivaji Sandhi in the 90s and tended to agree like with what was seen in the NMR for what the size of the skirmions are. It was Skirm's misfortune to be in three dimensions, but his one was a plane. Yeah, yeah, so 2D is very special in that respect. Yeah, with its scale invariant. Regarding the skirmion superconductive, here is the possible explanation for bilayer magic endographing. Yeah. I want to ask you because your, your, your sample actually, your samples do have a substrate. Yeah. And so with the substrate, you actually break the top and bottom layer symmetry. You have um, rush bar, effective rush bar fields. Yeah. How would that affect the picture? Uh, skirmion superconductivity. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I can comment on it in two levels. So. One is that this mapping um, where I said that the bands here are equivalent to this quantum Hall bilayer. Uh, one might think that, okay, well, we started out with a layer and that the notion which this is a bilayer is the same notion which this is bilayer, but it's actually a more complicated mapping. There's not a sense in which the top layer is the top layer of the graphene. Uh, it ends up being some coherent superposition, like layer space here is some coherent superposition of those and vice versa. Um, so we can't immediately think that like the substrate will affect this layer, not that layer. So it is a little bit complicated to analyze. Um, it's an interesting question. What happens if you have, for instance, spin orbit coupling coming from the substrates? Um, and we know from experience at Caltech that it seems to make a difference what the substrate is and the nature of the superconductivity. Um, I think it, it present, I'd say we don't know. In principle, you could get the skirmions either either way. It would depend on the magnitude of those terms and so on. So I want to say to anyone on uh, Zoom, if you have a question, you can either just unmute yourself or type in the chat box or raise your hand, whatever way. I don't know if you're here. I should be talking to my computer. Uh, what do we know? What do you know about the? Uh, I think the one I'm curious. Uh, nobody wrote a paper about the uh, uh, numerical evidence. Uh, yeah. The, the skirmion uh, here in the time state. So I didn't. I can't remember the detail of the paper. So yeah. It was and that's really my question. The second thing: what do we know about the critical current of the uh, skirmion? skirmion mm. uh, yeah. So, I mean, the first thing I didn't really put in this talk was any of the numerical work we've done. So um, I guess there's two things I'll quickly mention. One is in this idealized world, we've done some interesting numerical experiments where we literally take two copies of the quantum Hall effect with this term here. Uh, and there you can use all, like there's been a long history of doing strongly interacting numerical approaches to quantum Hall effects, like exact diagonalization and DMRG. And we can just apply this to this problem here. And you, you clearly see that when you dope it, you get superconductivity uh, in those models with, uh, you can measure the off diagonal long range order and do finite size scaling and it's quite clear. So in this idealized system, this mechanism certainly works. Now, as far as numerics on twisted bilayer graphene, um, what one finds is that um, you know, there's, there's a lot of details in the system depending on the precise shape of the dispersion. Um, 
And what we find is you can ask variational questions. Like when you put a charge in, you can write down variational states and ask is the cheapest way to do it as a skirmion or not. And in those variational calculations, you find that depending on the details of the dispersion, sometimes the skirmion is the lowest energy and sometimes the electron is. So I think it depends on some detailed energetic things that we just don't know because we don't know the microscopic model super precisely. But there's not like a factor of 10 off. Clearly there's large regions in the phase diagram where the skirmions are, are stable. And part of my group is working on doing full scale DMRG on this system to try and you know, just see at the quantum level what's the ground state. But it's, it's very difficult. There's a lot of degrees of freedom. So yeah. And then Patrick, I think Gil had one more question. So, uh, the, the critical oh, the critical current. Um, I wish I had a plot of it here. So uh, I need to think about it. So Well, I guess, I don't know, would it, would it be different? I don't know off the top of my head. I, mean, I don't think it would be particularly, so the only difference compared to say the BEC limit of superconductivity uh, potentially would be that if you look at the dispersion relation for the skirmions, um, it gets cut off at some particular momentum, a star. And then the skirmions become unstable. They just merge into some continuum. So the skirmions do have a cut off in case space. Uh, but at least at the level of detail that we have, it's otherwise not different than a BEC. Um, yeah. 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 So uh, these aren't numerics I've done, but there's some beautiful work which isn't published yet um, from the Oxford group. It's really cool. So they they do it's Hartree Fox. So it's a variational approach, but they do completely unrestricted Hartree Fox, and they just ask what's the lowest energy Slater determinant, not assuming any symmetries. They do it to the best model that we have of twist, twist bilayer graphene, and they see that when you add an electron or two electrons to the system on top of these insulators, they literally see the skirmion emerge in the Slater determinant. So in those pictures, you can actually see it. Um, and they'll have a typical size of one, like two, two more A. Um, so that's something like 20 nanometers. Um, so yeah, it's, it's like a couple more A, more A constants. Um, so the superconductivity is then at a density which is like kind of low compared to that size. Well, it's not that different, I guess. But yeah, yeah. It's since it's measured with respect to the insulator. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, though. Yeah, so in that sense, we already have pictures of skirmions, um, but the 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 anion. So, like in this case, what determines the size is something like a Zeeman energy, um, and the twisted bilayer graphene. The size is determined by some other type of anisotropy. Um, so, I, I don't expect the sizes to be quantitatively the same, just because the the deviations from perfect SO3 symmetry are different. <clears throat> this is kind of a similar limit, though. If you ask how big is that skirmion, it's about a magnetic length. So it's actually quite small. OK, looks like the zoom audience is also happy. So <laughs> in that case, let's thank Mike again. Uh, for the